puddings. Many people hear the word pudding today, and what do they think about? They think about some little custardy stuff in a cup, or uh, something you buy at the grocery store in a box, and mix it up with some milk. Pudding has a much deeper, richer history. Today we're gonna look at boiled puddings from the 17th and 18th century. So the word pudding is based on the uh, Old English words for gut or for stomach. And the original puddings were actually meat or organ meats mixed with grains and cooked in stomachs or in intestines. So much more like, say, modern day sausage or uh, if you've ever heard of a Scottish haggis. Haggises are like a true old pudding. So these original puddings had their ingredients stuffed in the stomach and then that tied off and they were put in boiling water and they were boiled for many hours. It wasn't until the 17th century, the early 17th century, when there was, an, there was a change, there was an evolution in this pudding. They started making these puddings in cloth sacks instead of in stomachs. And we started seeing the ingredients change a lot too. Some of the, the meats were taken out and more grains and some other things put in there. So we're starting to see an evolution in puddings and puddings started to become very popular in the 17th and 18th century. Most of those puddings in the 18th century uh, cookbooks call for four main ingredients. They called for flour, they called for milk, they called for eggs, and they called for some kind of fat. Usually suet is the one that's most often uh, referred to in the cookbooks. Suet can be very hard to come by in the United States. It's, it's not commonly used in cooking. So today we're going to substitute butter for the suet. So today we're going to be working on a, uh, a simple boiled plum pudding. Let's get started. So in addition to our four main ingredients, we've got some other smaller ingredients that we're going to talk about now. The, uh, we've got salt, which is uh, in most recipes. We also have a nutmeg. We're going to grate into that, which nutmeg is in all the different uh, pudding recipes. We've got some mace, which is in most of them, which is related to nutmeg. We've got ground ginger. Ground ginger, it was inexpensive in the time period and a very commonly used uh, spice. Uh, it's a plum pudding, and the plums aren't plums, but they're raisins in this. Uh, these have uh, regular raisins. We also have some currants, and currants in English cookbooks from the time period are actually just miniature uh, seedless raisins from the Corinth region. And we also have some sugar that we're going to add into this recipe. So before we get going, start mixing things, we need to have some things uh, happening in the background. I've got some water boiling here. We're going to need a pot. Uh, at least a gallon or so, so that we can uh, boil our pudding. We also need a pudding cloth, a piece of tightly woven uh, fabric, something not soapy but nice and clean. I'm going to toss this in the pot and then we can start mixing. I'm just going to toss this cloth in. We're going to leave it in here until I've got the batter all mixed up and ready to put inside of it. Well, let's start getting our uh, ingredients mixed up. Let's start with our wet ingredients. We need two eggs, and uh, we don't want both, uh, all of both of them. We want actually one whole egg, and then just the yolk from the other one. Uh, this egg, let's separate out. We just want the yolk, so I'm gonna split this open and separate it. There we are. So with our egg and a half here, we're gonna add about four ounces of milk. That should be about right. That's half a cup. Let's whisk this up, get these uh, mixed well. Okay, once we've got that mixed well, we're gonna set these uh, wet ingredients aside. So for our dry ingredients, we need our mixing bowl. We're gonna add um, about four ounces of flour. Should be about a cup. And uh, this is just plain uh, rough ground wheat flour. We're gonna add some uh, salt. Uh, not any great quantity, a teaspoonful or so. We're also going to add our mace again, about a teaspoonful. The recipes aren't real specific, so it's really uh, uh, flavor, well, how much you want, how much you like, so. And some of the ground ginger. Now let's put in, let's grind up some of our fresh nutmeg. Okay, looks about right. And finally, we have about a tablespoon of sugar. 
Now it's time to get the butter into these dry ingredients. This can be a little bit tricky. I've already chopped this butter up and I'm just going to put it in here and then use the spoon, mush it around and then crumble it up to get it in there. In the period recipes, they, uh, when they're using suet, they made they may actually were specific about not getting the, the suet too well mixed so that the suet would end up being little uh, in little pockets in the finished pudding and not spread completely throughout it. This, we want to get the butter pretty mixed up in here. I'm going to use about four ounces of butter. Okay, that looks pretty good. Now it's time to uh, mix in our milk and our eggs. Now it's time to add our final ingredient here. We're gonna add our raisins and currants. Okay. Here we are. And we're gonna mix those in well. So we wanna get a consistency that's a sort of a stiff battery, kind of a, kind of a drop biscuit consistency, not, not too uh, stiff and not so runny that it runs around. If it's too runny, add a little bit of flour. Uh, if it's a little too stiff, add a little bit more milk. You'll get to about this consistency. Let's get the bag ready to put this in. Okay. Now let's take our cloth. We just brought it out of the hot water. I'm gonna be kind of careful if it's too hot. We're gonna lay it out on a bowl here and we're gonna flour the inside of our bag or a piece of cloth. So I'm going to take some flour and I'm going to make sure that the whole inside of this is nice and floured. Here we are. Now we can get our, uh, our batter here and put it in. Now right, let's wrap it up. And we just need to tie this off. I've just got a little piece of a uh, little strip of fabric I'm going to use to tie it. <clears throat> so when we're ready to put the, the pudding in, you want to make sure that the water is fully boiling. We're going to drop this pudding in. This is a smaller sized pudding. Uh, it's about a quarter of a normal recipe. So this one should take about two hours and maybe as much as three hours to cook. But I wouldn't cook it any more than that. Two hours is about right. You don't really have a good way to know exactly when it's done. I mean, it's not a good way to check it. So you just have to know that this size takes about two hours. That's about it. Usually if it's a full recipe size, like most of the ones use a pound of, of flour and a pound of suet, uh, those are much bigger, almost a soccer ball size. Those take quite a while to bake, or uh, quite a while to cook. Four hours at least, and probably more like five or six. When are pudding is about done. It's time to work on the sauce portion. And uh, we've got a, uh, a nice redware pipkin that we're going to prepare our sauce in. Our sauce has three components. We've got some sack wine, which is a white wine from Spain, commonly known today as sherry. Uh, we need some sugar, and then we're going to add some butter. But first, let's put together the uh, sack and the sugar and warm them up. So, let's warm up our Pipkin, we're going to add about a cup of our sack wine. There we go. And we're going to start to put in our sugar. This is about uh, two tablespoons of sugar we're going to add in. And let's get these mixed up and warmed up. So let's take our sack and our sugar off the fire now. And uh, now that it's warm, we're, we're going to take and we're going to add our butter in a little bit at a time. Uh, we're going to stir it in, whisk it in. It's best if your butter's cold and that way it won't separate. We're going to add about three tablespoons of butter just a little bit at a time and keep whisking it up. So you want to keep whisking and slowly incorporate the butter one piece at a time. As it gets uh, incorporated, then you add the next little piece. And just keep whisking the whole time. That's going to taste really good on this pudding. Our uh, sauce, we're going to set that away from the fire so it doesn't heat up and separate. Let's get this pudding out. Okay, there it is. 
Okay, we're gonna put this in cold water here just to cool it off. Now we can open it up. Okay, let's uh, crack this open. Now I'll turn it out onto a plate. Let's see, oh, here, scissors. And now, a little sauce. Mm. This pudding is really great. That sauce really lifts it up, and uh, the raisins are really, really good in this uh, bready kind of a, a pudding mix. Very nice. You know, I've prepared some variations on this same basic recipe. Here's a cornmeal pudding. Uh, this one's uh, got butter, but it's a plain cornmeal pudding, like a cornmeal dumpling. Here's a, uh, a pudding that I did. With, uh, it's a plain bread pudding. It's got carrots in it, though. And then here's a final one over here. Here's a suet and um, oatmeal. So that's a, there's a lot of different interesting variations you can do. Plain ones to go along with different meats. Um, you can add vegetables, and you can change the grains. So there's so many interesting things you can do with boiled puddings. I really encourage you to, to uh, try one of these boiled puddings out. Very popular for an 18th century dish. So in last week's episode, we covered a simple boiled plum pudding, which consisted of equal parts flour, milk, eggs, butter, and the plums, or, or raisins in that case. But I thought we would look at the boiled puddings and explore this idea a little bit farther. I think there's a lot more to learn. So here's a little piece that I ran onto while I was doing research. It's from a 1780 uh, Gentleman's Monthly Intelligencer. And it's a section on diet. It says, there is at this time, residing in Essex, a person famed for his mode of living. Being formerly reduced to a state of general weakness from free and luxurious living, he took up a resolution of dieting himself thus. He has a pound of flour and a pint of cold water mixed, and then tied up in a cloth and boiled. And on this food he's lived entirely for many years. Though he is old, he is hearty, strong, vigorous, and active. I thought that was very interesting. Somebody uh, living on nothing but flour, a flour pudding boiled. And then I was thinking about soldiers living on uh, nothing but their meat and a simple flour ration. Also, uh, many period recipes cover um, putting apples inside of a, of, of a pudding and boiling that. Those two ideas I thought we'd put together and make a simple soldier style pudding, nothing but flour and an apple uh, off of a tree and wrapped in a little bit of scrap cloth just what a soldier might be able to make. So let's make up a very simple, uh, nothing but flour and water uh, paste. We're just gonna take about two handfuls of uh, flour. We're gonna add in it's just some nice cool water and then mix that up. Kinda of want it to be um, not very stiff kind of a paste here. Okay, so not too stiff. We wanna be able to form it around it without it fighting. Once that's ready, we need to take our apple, and I've already quartered this. We're going to uh, take out the seeds and the stem. Let's take our quartered apple and put it back together into an apple shape. And then take our paste, which is thickened up a little bit as I was working on it. We're just going to wrap it around that apple so it's all about a quarter of an inch thick. It grows as it cooks, so it doesn't need to be terribly thick. And there we can see. Now we can put this inside of our floured cloth. Uh, there we are. And let's flour this up. 
And now it's time to wrap it up in that cloth. You're just going to set it in the center and gather it up. You definitely want to give it a little bit of room so that it can uh, grow while it's cooking. Not, uh, not too tight. Let's go toss it in. Let's make sure our water is boiling and should take about an hour for this apple pudding. While this is cooking, we're going to cover a quaking pudding. Those don't take very long to cook either. So a quaking pudding is much more like that modern day pudding idea that we have in our heads. Let's take a look at the ingredients. So let's put together this pudding. We're going to uh, put together our dry ingredients first and then our wet ingredients. We're going to need about a half a cup of flour. Uh, we don't have to be precise. This is definitely different than the plum pudding. The uh, ratios are, are much different. Well, a lot less flour and a lot more liquid parts. About a half a cup of flour. Uh, now let's put in our, we need about uh, two tablespoons of sugar. I got this pretty much pre-ground up. And there we are. Um, we need some, some salt, uh, maybe a half a teaspoon of salt. Uh, we're definitely going to need some of those same kind of spices. We've got some mace here, a teaspoonful. We've got some ground ginger, same amount. So you'll need a quarter to a half of a nutmeg grated up, depending on your, uh, your taste. For our last uh, in dry ingredient, I have some, uh, some almonds here. I've got uh, maybe a half a cup of slivered almonds. We're going to mash these up. So once these are good and mashed up, we can add these to our dry ingredients, or the rest of them here. There we are. Now we need a, a cup of heavy cream and uh, four eggs. We actually want uh, two whole eggs and just the yolks of the other two. And then we're going to uh, whisk these together. So there are our eggs and our cream. We want to get these whisked really well. Now that we've got these all mixed, put our wet and dry ingredients together. There we are. And once these are well mixed, we need to get our pudding cloth ready. Okay, now we've got our cloth, but instead of putting it in the boiling water and then flouring it, this one we want to seal a little tighter. So we're going to butter it first and then flour it. Get it to smear all the way into our fabric. There, now once it's buttered, we can just put our flour on just like before. Now we can take our buttered and floured cloth and put it in a bowl and pour our pudding mix in. Here we are, and tie it up. This is another pudding that you want to give a little bit of room to grow. And there we go. And it's ready to go in. Let's make sure that water's boiling. Okay. <coughs> This uh, quaking pudding should take about a half hour to cook. Now that that quaking pudding is uh, cooking, we're going to make a quick sauce with some butter and some sugar. When you use these pipkins, you want to make sure that you don't put them on direct heat with flames. You want to use them only on coals. You want to make sure that you always have something in them or else they'll get too hot and they'll crack and uh, use them gently with gentle heat. It's been about a half hour for the uh, quaking pudding and about an hour for the apple one, so both of those should be ready to come out. Let's cut open this uh, apple pudding or apple dumpling. And there's our pudding. Let's slice it and see how it turned out. 
and look at that. You'd be amazed with nothing but a little bit of flour and one apple what you can turn out. It's really good. So I haven't found much about soldiers doing boiled puddings yet, but there is a piece in Joseph Plum Martin's book about soldiers coming and stealing a woman's food, including her pudding, bag and all. Not for our quaking pudding. This one's a little bit more, you have to be more gentle with it. Now let's dress this up with a, a few slivered almonds and then pour the sauce on top. Wow, that's delectable. You'll love this wonderful quaking pudding. A lot more custardy than the other ones, not nearly as bready. And that butter and sugar on top with the almonds, it looks beautiful and it tastes good. We've had a number of inquiries uh, for information about the new background setting that we've been using in our cooking series. Thought today I'd give you an introduction to the new test kitchen here at James Townsend and Son. So a kitchen setting like this has really been on my list of sort of wants for 20 some years. And while we were doing the cooking series uh, outside, uh, the first cooking series, uh, when it got to be winter time we couldn't do them outside anymore, it seemed to be the perfect opportunity to put together a project like this. In preparation for this project, I spent several months studying uh, thousands, literally thousands, of period paintings and pictures of historic sites, looking for just the right sort of kitchen. The kitchen that would uh, give it a, a period feel, but would also uh, make it much easier to photograph the kind of things we were cooking. Really, the heart of a kitchen is the hearth. Let's take a look at this hearth. For a hearth, we've chosen a raised hearth design. Uh, it's not nearly uh, as common as the floor hearth uh, that you see in, in most uh, paintings, but you do see these in Northern Europe, uh, places like Germany and Sweden, and in, even in North America where immigrants had come from Northern Europe, and they were used to this sort of design. Now, this uh, gets all the cooking up off the floor, makes it much easier to see. Along with the hearth here, we also have an oven that opens right out into the hearth. The oven that we built right here on the hearth is exactly like the earthen oven that we built in our first video series. This one we built on the back side of the hearth wall and we connected it right into the hearth area so that we can take coals out of the oven, put them on our hearth to use them for cooking. Ovens built into the hearths, very common feature in 18th century households. I even was very specific about our windows and walls. I really wanted to have a good 18th century look. This uh, little episode has been a bit of a departure because we're working really hard on the print catalog. It's going to be huge. It's got a lot of uh, great new products in it. So bear with us while we take time to work on that catalog. We also want to uh, thank you for all the great suggestions and ideas that are coming in on Facebook and, and on the contact page of the website. Keep those ideas coming. All the things you've seen here today, all the items and the clothing, these things are available in our catalog on the website and don't forget to follow us on Facebook. If you seek the advice of 50 different people about seasoning cast iron ware, you'll likely get 52 answers. Today we're going to look at how to season your cast iron ware. Before you can cook with iron ware, it has to be seasoned. And the seasoning does several different things. Uh, first of all, it keeps your iron ware from rusting. It also creates a non-stick surface so that it makes it much easier to clean after you're done cooking. 
and it also separates your food from the metal so you don't get a metallic taste in your food when it's done. So the idea of seasoning is to get multiple layers of carbonized oil on the metal. The real questions are, what oil do we use and how do we get it carbonized? So the first question, what oil? You're going to get a whole lot of different answers about what kind of oil to use. And most oils are going to work just fine, some better than others. Uh, in the time period, most people probably used animal fats like lard or beef tallow. Most people today, they use vegetable oil. Today we're going to be using flaxseed oil. Flaxseed oil seems to give the hardest non-stick surface of any of the vegetable oils. It does go rancid rather rapidly, so you want to make sure to use fresh flaxseed oil. Once it's been carbonized on the surface, we don't have to worry about it going rancid. So, As for the how, we're going to do two different methods of seasoning today. And which one you choose really depends on the tools you have available to you and how, the, how big the piece is that you need to do. Today we're going to season a small cast iron pot. Now this guy's small enough that he'll fit in our oven uh, so we can simply bake the finish on. The pot we're using today is a brand new one, so it doesn't have any coatings on it at all. If you have a pot that has any kind of wax coating or old seasoning on it, you want to make sure to wash these off, even new ones like this, wash it off to get any coatings at all. Make sure you get any soap residues uh, washed off completely. And then as soon as it's out of the water, you want to warm it up and dry off the pot to make sure it doesn't rust. Our pot is now dry and it's warm. It being warmed up is really going to help the oil soak into the pores. Let's get some oil onto this. We're going to put oil on the inside and the outside of the pot. We want to get a nice thin coating all over the inside and all over the outside. You want to make sure to have your work surface uh, protected because this is a messy job. Once we've got the oil completely covering this pot on every surface, then we can take a rag and we can wipe it off making sure that we don't have any excess oil. We don't want it to pool up and get thick any place. We want to have just one thin layer. Okay. So I've got the uh, oven fired up. It's uh, five or six hundred degrees in there. Now you may not have an oven like this. Uh, you can do this in a regular home oven. Just set it for 450 or 500, whatever the maximum temperature is for your home oven. But be aware that this is a smoky and smelly operation. If you do it in your home, you're going to need the windows open, the doors open. While that's baking, we're going to season another method. If your object is too large to bake, or if you want to do it outside on an open fire where the smoke won't harm your house, um, you can do the seasoning on an open fire. And what we're going to do is we're going to take uh, one of these little folding frying pans and we're going to season this on an open flame. Our folding frying pans come pre-seasoned, but if you want them to work better, it's best to get another couple coatings of seasoning on the pan. I've got this pan heated up just like I heated up the other piece and we're going to put oil on it. We want to get a coating on this pan exactly like the other pot. We want to get a nice thin layer on all the surfaces on the outside and the inside. Let's put it on the fire. Now let's heat the pan up until we start to see some smoke. So as this heats up, it's going to start smoking and it's going to start turning black. And what we want to do is uh, make sure that we don't get it too hot. It's a bit of a fine line. If you get it too hot, you'll actually burn the seasoning off. You don't want to do that. Uh, but as soon as that turns black, it starts smoking up, we're going to put another thin layer on it. You also want to hit the bottom so that it uh, gets a good layer on it. And then we just put it back on again for a minute or so. We want to have a lot of layers on this, at least a half a dozen. As you can see, for a job like this, 
a good pair of leather gloves, it's a must. Looks like the pan is done. I've got a good half a dozen coats of seasoning on this. It's a nice, even uh, black color on the inside. It hasn't gotten too hot, it hasn't burned the seasoning off, so this pan is done. Now it's time to look to see how our pot is doing in the oven. This pot has just a single layer of seasoning on it, so we're going to need to do the same thing. Uh, we're gonna to need to put, uh, use our cloth, put on more oil, nice thin coat, put it back in the oven. Seasoning, it's a simple but necessary task for your cookware. When you're taking care of this seasoning, you wanna make sure that uh, when you wash out these pots, you don't leave them soaking a long time. Don't use harsh detergents or those will go into the coating and make your food taste like soap the next time you use it. And you wanna make sure to store them so that they stay nice and dry. It's springtime. It's time to pick stinging nettles so you can make nettle soup. Stinging nettles hold a very special place in 18th century food and medicine. Uh, medical books from the time period mention these stinging nettles as good for stopping hemorrhages and promoting urine flow. John Heckewelder was a missionary in remote Pennsylvania in 1756. And in his journal, he writes this. We lived mostly upon nettles, which grew abundantly in the bottoms, and of which we frequently made two meals a day. That's amazing. You know, I think we've got enough nettles. Let's head to the kitchen. I've got a good bunch of nettles gathered here. These are early springtime nettles, the best ones, right after they come out of the ground. You want to get the first half of the plant or first three or four inches. You don't want any of the hard stalk or any of the roots. You might want to wear gloves when you pick these because they, they sting a little bit, but in the early spring, it's usually not too bad. Wash these off like you would uh, lettuce uh, for a salad. Now, let's work on the base of our soup. We need to uh, get some water boiling here in our kettle. We've got about a quart and a half or so here. And while that's heating up, we're going to saute some onions and a little bit of butter. This is about four ounces of butter. Hannah Glass's recipe for meager soup calls for the butter to be cooked until it's done making noise, and then you add the onions. You're going to use about three medium onions. While our onions are browning, let's chop up our nettles nice and fine. We can take our chopped nettles now and put it right into our browning onions. Well, we stirred these for about five or 10 minutes, and now it's time to shake on about a quarter of a cup of flour into this. And a little salt and pepper. So now it's time to add the contents of our pan to our boiling water. Many 18th century soup recipes call for a chopped up stale bread crust to be added to the soup. We're gonna let this simmer for another 10 minutes. And then, as an optional finishing touch, we're gonna add a little bit of this mushroom ketchup that we've made in an earlier episode. 
is excellent. If you've never had nettles before, nettle soup or any other kind of nettles, it's the perfect time of year right now to go out and pick them. A lot of people have expressed interest in the earthen oven that we did in our last series in an earlier episode. Today I want to take that idea to its most simple and extremely primitive form. I want to make an oven out of the least quantity of materials in the shortest possible time. We're going to use the most basic and easy to obtain materials possible. Uh, for the clay in this oven we're going to use kitty litter, plain unscented clumping cat litter. You're probably going to need two bags or 50 pounds. I'm also going to use some play sand. This is just simple play sand you can get at your hardware store, at the building supply store, either place. I've got about four bags and they're about 25 pounds, so about 100 pounds of sand. We're going to need a few other things. Uh, you're going to, obviously, you're going to need some water. Uh, I've found some uh, straw here on the site, uh, straw or, or dried grass. Uh, I've got some sticks here, some uh, dried sticks. Um, we're also going to need some bendy sticks. So earlier I cut up some, uh, some light green saplings. You need something that can bend in that kind of a form. Nice tight bend. You'll need a shovel and uh, to fill in the gaps on our, on our, um, on our frame we're going to use a little bit of uh, scrap or old fabric. You'll probably want something that's not synthetic so it doesn't smell too bad when it burns up. And we're going to need our uh, mixing tarp also. You're also going to need some firewood, something that's split up nice and fine to burn in your oven. You're going to need a, a good little bit of it. And as an option, if you want a nice flat floor, you'll want a, a sacrificial board. This is about a 1x8 or a 1x10, about 18 inches long. Uh, this will burn away, but it'll leave a nice flat floor in your oven. Let's get started. You need to make sure to pick a spot that's nice and level and not too close to tents or buildings. Uh, first thing we're going to do is make the floor of our oven. I'm going to take sticks, uh, just dry sticks, about uh, half an inch or three quarters of an inch diameter. These sticks should give us a little bit of an insulating layer underneath our floor. On top of this we're going to lay down a, a quick cob slab, about an inch thick or so, right on top of these sticks. We're going to make the cob just like last time. I've got about two scoops of sand down here on my tarp and here's a, a scoop of uh, the uh, clay that's already been pre-moistened. Okay, I think our floor cob is ready to go. Uh, it's, uh, it'll still break apart, but uh, it forms up nicely, not like just plain sand. We're going to make the floor about 15 or 20 inches in diameter here, where the oven body is going to be, and maybe about uh, 10 inches or 12 inches wide here at the mouth of it. So all we're going to do is take our pre-made cob here. We're going to just lay out. Okay, this is going to be the floor and here's our sacrificial board. We're just going to set it right on here right now. This is going to be the very back of the oven and this will be the door as it comes out. Now it's time to take our bendy sticks and make our basket frame that's going to be uh, the inside shape of our oven. Let's make our, our uh, basket work interior. Uh, in a previous episode, we uh, made our oven with a sand dome. Now that works really good if you've got a lot of time. This one we want to burn right away, so we're going to make it with the twig uh, basket work instead of the sand dome. We're just going to take our sticks. I've already kind of pre-cut them in somewhat of a right uh, shape and we're going to drive them into the ground. Hopefully it's soft enough and just sort of build a basket around our oven here. And that might be a little short. So I'm just going to shorten it up a little bit. There we go. That looks good. We're just going to play this by ear. Obviously, I didn't make this for neatness or perfection. All this interior work is going to burn away, so it's just quick and dirty. Now it's time to make some cob 
and then we can start putting it on the frame. There, the body of the oven is all done. We've used exactly the materials we brought, two bags of kitty litter, four bags of sand, and it's a, about inch and a half to three inches thick all the way over the body of it. I paid, paid special attention to the door area, uh, trying to get that. This is going to be the weakest part, so you wanna be careful about how you form this so that it stays strong enough. It, you know, usually we would let this oven dry a day, two, several weeks even, before we fired it up. But we want to cook in this oven right away, and we're willing to break it. So let's start a fire in it right now to get this dried out. The trick to getting the fire going in this is that we want to start off small. We don't want to burn away our basket that's holding this up before this starts to get some dry strength. So we're going to start off with a small fire. There we go, we've got a good small fire going in that. As, as the uh, oven warms up, we're gonna uh, make the fire just a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger. It's gonna take six to 12 hours to dry this oven out so that it's ready to bake in. I've had this thing cooking for a couple of hours uh, and it's really starting to dry out pretty rapidly in this uh, bright sunlight. Already the very top here is dry. You can tell by the color of it. It's a nice light gray. Uh, the sides are still soft, um, so they're going to take a, a good bit more uh, fire in here before the sides start to dry out, but it doesn't take much effort. Just uh, chuck some firewood in it every uh, little while and uh, it'll keep drying out. Our oven, uh, it baked overnight with coals in it, and I got to it this morning, and it was stone cold, but it looks very dry, other than some very uh, minor spots on the very back side. Everything's dry on the oven, so it's ready to bake in. I went ahead and restarted the fire this morning. It's been going about an hour. I got some nice hot coals in there, and the oven's already feels like it's pretty much up to temperature, nice and warm on the top. Now what we have to worry about is a door. Now, you could come prepared with a door all ready to use. You can build your oven and have the door made so that it'll, it'll fit right up against the door. You don't want to build it uh, your oven so the door fits on the inside because it'll shrink just a little bit and then your door won't fit. But if you build it so your door will fit right up against the mouth of the oven, that'll work if you come with a pre-made door. Now, if you don't come with a pre-made door, uh, then you can use something else, something on hand. I've got here a bannock board, will likely work as your door, or uh, if you don't have that, maybe uh, a big split of firewood will work as your door. It's time for me to get this thing ready and uh, put some bread dough in it and see if we can bake some bread. Been about 15 minutes and that bread looks just right. That's great. 18th century cookbooks abound with recipes for simple biscuits, something we might call a cross between a cookie and a cracker. Today, we're going to bake some simple biscuits.
Today's recipe is based on a recipe out of Eliza Smith's cookbook. And let me read you the recipe. It says, uh, to make biscuits, to a quart of flour, take a quarter of a pound of butter and a quarter of a pound of sugar, one egg, and what caraway seeds you please. Uh, wet it with milk as stiff as you can and then roll them out very thin. Cut them with a small glass and bake them on tin plates. Your oven must be slack. Prick them well just before you set them in and keep them dry when baked. Today's simple biscuit recipe has flour, butter, uh, some eggs, a little bit of sugar, milk, and caraway seeds for flavoring. Caraway seeds are a favorite flavoring for biscuits and cookies in the 18th century. I've got my oven preheating, and while that's preheating, I'm going to set uh, four ounces of butter here in a skillet right at the edge of the oven uh, to melt it. We're going to start with four cups of flour, and into that I'm going to uh, mix up uh, a half a cup of sugar. Now is a good time to add our caraway seeds to our mixture. And you just add as many as uh, you think is fit for uh, your taste. Now it's time to take one egg, whisk it up, and add it to our flour. Let's get this whisked here. It doesn't need to be done extremely well. This is uh, just to get it mixed up. Let's put that into our flour. And now our pre-melted butter, we can add that right in too. We want to make sure it's not too hot. We don't want to cook our egg with that. Let's get this mixed up. The recipe says to mix these in and we will get too stiff of a paste and we add the milk in uh, to get to the right consistency. We're just gonna go a little bit at a time I think just a little bit more should bring us to our right stiffness. Okay, let's turn this out onto a floured surface and we can start to work it into a, a flat sheet. Got some flour here. I'll just get a nice surface. Turn out our dough here. Out. The recipe calls for it to be very thin. There, I've got that rolled out nice and thin, probably about an eighth of an inch thick. And we are going to now uh, cut these out and put them on our baking tin. I've got the oven cleaned out, and I'm going to make sure to put a uh, trivet in the, in the uh, oven so that uh, the biscuits don't burn on the bottom. I've got a well-greased uh, baking tin here. Let's uh, put our biscuits on there. And we don't have to uh, worry about these growing on the sheet, so we can, we can put these right up against each other. There's no leavening in this. They're almost... Uh, a bit more like a cracker than they are a biscuit. Uh, all we need to do is place them on the tin and then right before we put them in the oven, we're gonna follow the directions in the uh, book and uh, poke little holes in them. The recipe calls for a slack oven. So uh, under 300 degrees, 250 to 300. And this is going to take, depending on the temperature of your oven, uh, 7 to 15 minutes. 18th century cookbooks are chock full of really interesting recipes. They're a, a great way to kind of dig back into history and find out what it was really like through taste. Now, I can smell those uh, 
biscuits cooking, so they're probably just about right. They're one of those kinds of things you really have to watch them to make sure they don't burn. You don't want to get these all black on the bottom. Let's go check these out. Looks like they turned out just perfectly. Uh, very light golden brown. Nice and crispy. They should be uh, uh, something that's kept dry. They're meant to be a, a crispy, dry, snappy kind of a, a cookie. Almost um, a cross between a cracker and a cookie. Very good. Tinned and soldered cooking vessels were extremely common in the 18th century. You can see them in, in all sorts of uh, cooking situations, hearth settings, or in co at campsites. Today we're going to talk about how to take care of and use your tinned or uh, soldered cooking vessel so that it'll last a lifetime. Whether you're using a tin cooking pot, a, a brass trade kettle, or one of these beautiful pieces of copper, there are certain very important things you need to be aware of about how to use them and how to clean them. Tin cooking pots like this are the most common cooking implement for soldiers during the Revolutionary War time period. Really the only thing that was issued to them uh, for cooking in. Now, the first rule on all these pots, this one included, is that a pot like this put over the fire when it's empty might ruin the pot in seconds. It'll start to uh, melt the joints if it doesn't have any contents in it. The same can be said for these tin lined cooking pots. Uh, the, the tin melts at about 450 degrees, so if you set this over a fire empty, the tin will immediately start to melt and run down the sides of the vessel. By the way, these brass trade kettles are exceptional reproductions, beautifully handmade. Uh, they're perfect for 17th, 18th, and 19th century, great for the hearth, and really good for the field too. The purpose of tin lining the uh, copper and brass vessels is to, to create a protective coating in between the food that's being cooked and the outer uh, cooking vessel, the, the copper and the brass. Some foods, especially acidic foods, uh, will cause some of the copper to leach out and react with the food. Historically, uh, many of the brass and copper pots in the time period were untinned. They didn't have any tin lining in them. And cooks in the time period knew exactly how to cook in them so that they didn't get poisoned. But tin lined pots are very common, uh, easily documented for the time period, and many of the period texts uh, that talk about cooking uh, specifically refer to making sure your pot has a good tin lining within them. So the tin inside these tin lined pots is a much safer metal uh, to work with, but it is soft and you have to take a lot of care of it when you're using it. Uh, the, uh, the metal, uh, as you use these pots, may start to turn a darker color. Uh, that is a perfectly normal reaction in the tin and it doesn't really change its uh, protective qualities. After long use, you may notice uh, the lining starting to wear away. Uh, and if you see large spots of brass or copper exposed, it's time to have your pots relined. To prolong the life of the tin lining in your cooking pot, you really need to make sure to use uh, wooden cooking implements. Don't use anything that's hard, any kind of metal instrument at all, or you'll scratch the lining of your pot. When cooking with these tin lined uh, cooking vessels, you need to make sure that you have as much uh, fluid in them as possible. Uh, if you have less than a full amount you have to be careful. If you put this over a roaring fire, um, the, it will start to heat up the areas above the spot where the food is at and it'll start to melt the tin away from that area. So you want to use just as much fire as you really need uh, to get the cooking done. These transfer the heat very quickly and so it does not take a roaring fire to cook with these vessels and, and the less fire the better. The longer your tin lining is going to last. When you're done cooking, and it's time to clean the inside of your pot, you want to make sure to use only a mild detergent and a cloth on the inside when you're cleaning. Don't use any sort of uh, scouring pad. You don't want to wear away the surface. Uh, if you have cooked on food uh, that's difficult to remove, just soak it overnight. Maybe you could warm it up a little bit 
and then that will, will, break, uh, will come off very easily. An excellent way to clean the outside of your copper pot is to use a lemon wedge. You dip that in a little bit of salt and then you just rub it on the outside of the pot. If you don't have a lemon wedge, then what you want to use is a little bit of vinegar as a substitute. There are also numerous uh, commercial copper cleaners available on the market. Now, regardless of which method you use, uh, you need to make sure to rinse off the outside of your pot completely to get rid of all the cleaner and then dry it off before you store it. Foods of the 18th century were often very regional. Take, for instance, this little dish. It's uh, sweet, it's buttery, it's custardy, and it's bready. It's a bready little dessert. It's also got raisins and dates in it. In many places, this might be called a bread pudding, but this regional variation is famously known as white pot. We found a number of white pot recipes, some as early as the 16th century and others right on into the 18th century. Uh, the term white pot is a provincial phrase originating from southwest England, uh, specifically the Devon area, and it simply means white pudding. Recipes for white pot change very little over the years. They, they primarily consist of bread, sometimes rice, uh, sugar, eggs, uh, usually cream, some spice, and sometimes a little bit of fruit. Let's get started. The first thing we need to do is preheat our oven. We're going to be using a Dutch oven today. If you're going to use a Dutch oven, you need to get an ember bed ready for that. If you're using a wood-fired oven, that needs to be fired up, but you'll need to let it cool down a little bit to get to the right temperature. And if you're uh, using a regular home oven, you need to preheat it to 350 degrees. We're using our averted saucepan today. You could use a pipkin uh, or a boiler or whatever you have available. We're going to begin by placing a pint of cream in our saucepan. Uh, now let's place a stick of cinnamon in that, uh, a pinch of salt here, a little bit of mace, and now let's grind some fresh nutmeg. As soon as this begins to simmer, you're going to need to remove it from the heat and let it cool down. Now let's take care of our eggs. Uh, we need two whole eggs in this. And we need one egg yolk. Okay. And now we need two to three tablespoons of sugar. Now we have to do is whisk this together. Now that our cream is simmering, let's go ahead and take it off and let it cool down. I'm gonna take some nice white bread now, and I'm gonna slice it very, very thin, and then take off the crust. So I'm left with nothing but the crumb. We'll need enough crumb to fill up our baking dish. In this case, I'm using one of our tin eating bowls. Uh, you could also, if you wanted a larger one, uh, use one of, of these milk pans, uh, but you definitely need about uh, twice the amount of ingredients, and you'd need to increase the baking time. Each one of these slices I'm going to butter quite liberally on one side. I'm going to end up using about a half a cup of butter, one stick. While we've got our butter out, it's time to butter our pan. The bowl needs to be buttered liberally or the sugar that's in our white pot will make it very difficult to release. And now our cream has cooled a bit. We can take out the cinnamon stick and now we're going to add just a little bit of the warm cream mixture into the eggs while we whisk it, just a little bit first to temper the eggs so that the eggs don't curdle. Once we've got a little bit in, we've got that totally whisk in, we can start adding the rest little by little. Now let's get started with our layering. We're going to start by putting in bread in the bottom of our bowl. We want to put it uh, the butter side down. We're going to put in two pieces here. That will cover up the bottom of the bowl. And now let's put a layer of raisins and dates in on top of that. That's good. We're going to do another layer, butter side down, of the bread. So we want to make sure that there are no air gaps. So if you need to tear your bread up a little bit to fill in the gaps, do that. Our raisins and dates again. Once we've got our second layer here, we can start to add some of our custard mixture. Uh, we're going to just pour in enough 
that it soaks into these two bottom layers but doesn't come up above the top of that bread. So that looks pretty good. Let's just do another layer. Our dish is filled up. Let's put uh, our custard mixture in until it fills it right up and soaks in. So that looks good. I think we'll be able to use just about all of it. That looks good. Now we're gonna take our final uh, pieces of buttered bread that, that are just gonna fill up the top. We're gonna put this in butter side up instead of butter side down and fill that top. Oh yeah, there we go. We're gonna tamp that down just a little bit so that it soaks uh, up from the bottom. And now we're gonna add some sugar to the top of it. We probably got another tablespoon here or so. Now that's ready to bake. Now it's time to bake this guy. We're gonna be using this Dutch oven. I've got it already uh, preheated some. And we're gonna set it on a ring of coals that we've got already set up here. Now let's place our trivet inside and then we can add our pudding, our white pot in right up on top. Now we can set our lid on. I'm going to put some coals up on top. Again, usually we just need a ring of coals that go around the outside edge here. Okay, we've got our ring of coals up on top, uh, so I'm going to keep watching this, and at times I'll have to renew the coals up on top and maybe even tuck a few more in the bottom. While white pots originated from the Devon area, they were certainly well known to colonial cooks as well. While they might not have kept the same name, they kept the same construction. Uh, bread puddings have become popular again today, and some chefs have even discovered this interesting variation. It's starting to smell really good and it's only been about 35 minutes. Uh, let's take a, a quick look at this. As you can see, this already well on its way. So we're gonna take this out. This is done. We're gonna let this cool and then turn it out onto a plate. If you happen to have a salamander, you can heat it up very hot, uh, then sprinkle some sugar on top of your white pot and brown it. You can also do that with a kitchen torch or with a broiler. Just be careful not to burn your white pot. A nice finishing touch would be some fresh cream poured on top or maybe a little sack which is what we call sweet sherry. It's very common in 18th century recipes. Wow, that is excellent. It's buttery. Uh, the sweetness of the sweet meats and the custard really sets it off. It's delicious. You're gonna love this. Today I'm going to be preparing a couple of very easy 18th century side dishes using asparagus. Now for those of you who don't like asparagus, well, frankly, you just leave more for the rest of us, but I suggest you give these a second chance. For those of you who like asparagus, you're gonna love these dishes. Asparagus has been a springtime delicacy for thousands of years. The Romans went to great lengths to extend its season. They even sent asparagus up into the high Alps so it would be frozen so they could have it later on in the year for various ceremonies. Likewise, 18th century Europeans 
used greenhouses so they could enjoy it more often. Asparagus is native to Western Europe, but it was imported into North America by early colonists. It's a vegetable that uh, colonial cooks were very familiar with. The recipes for today are from the 1774 edition of Hannah Glass's cookbook, uh, The Art of Cookery Made Plain and Easy. Let's get started. Our first recipe today is called asparagus forced in a French roll. Uh, the word forced in this setting means stuffed. Uh, previously, I've got a, uh, a pot of water, salted water, uh, over the fire to boil. Asparagus needs to be prepared for our recipe here. It calls for only the edible head, not the uh, inedible stalk uh, or the woody stem to be eaten. And there's an easy way to, to uh, figure out where that break is. You just take your, your asparagus and you bend it and it'll snap. Uh, this lower half we're going to discard and the upper half we're going to keep. The recipe today calls for the stems to be scraped so you can take a, a knife or something and, and just take the very uh, surface off the bottom end here. I got a small French loaf here. I'm going to uh, cut the top off making sure that I can put it back on as a lid when we're done. I'm going to take most of the crumb out so leaving about a half inch to three quarters of an inch of uh, crust all the way around, sort of creating a boat. If we manage to pierce the bottom of it by accident or someplace, we can take some of the crumb and press it into place to fill the hole. I'm also going to cut some small holes in the top of the crust. Trust me, this will make sense later. I'm going to start with about four tablespoons of butter. And uh, when that's melted and done frothing, I'm going to fry up our bread crust. I need to be careful as I'm frying up my bread crust that I want to break it. Also, uh, you want to watch it to make sure it doesn't burn. There, that's perfect. Before we put our asparagus in the boiling water, we need to start working on our sauce. The sauce in the recipe here is sort of a custard sauce. We'll start by placing a cup of cream over low heat to bring it to a simmer. Next, we're going to beat together four egg yolks, a little salt, pepper, and nutmeg. Once our cream has come to a simmer, it's time to start adding it to our egg yolks. We do that by adding just a tiny bit at first and whisking it in completely. I'll keep doing this until all the cream is incorporated into the egg yolks. Before we continue with the sauce, let's put our asparagus into our boiling water. You want to boil your asparagus for about eight minutes. You don't want uh, you want to watch it. You don't want to get too limp. And now it's time to put our sauce on low heat. We're going to put it on low heat and stir it until it thickens. Our asparagus is now done. You need to reserve enough of the uh, uh, tops to fill in as a garnish uh, the top of your bread. Let's put this all together. We're going to fill our fried French roll here with a layer of asparagus. Now we're going to put in uh, the sauce on top. Now we can put in another layer of asparagus. Let's top it off with the rest of our custard sauce. And now we can put on the lid. And now, the garnish. There, a beautiful side dish of asparagus forced in a French roll. It's easy to go to the grocer today and uh, purchase asparagus just about any time of the year. But in the 1700s, the window of opportunity for enjoying this vegetable was very narrow. Since asparagus was available for such short periods of time, what couldn't be eaten was either pickled or it was allowed to go to seed. Seasonality was a way of life in early times. Food and food preparations were connected with holidays so that the, uh, the activities of the holidays were always associated with the foods that were available. St. Martin's Day, for instance, is in the middle of November a time when winter wheat needed to be uh, planted, and it was also the perfect time to slaughter livestock. Uh, the cooler temperatures led to less spoilage and higher quality meat. It seems that many of us today 
have become disconnected with the rhythmic effect of the seasons on our daily lives. But for the person in the 18th century, the ebb and flow of the seasonal factors would have been an inescapable way of life. Our next recipe is an asparagus ragu. This is going to be very easy. We're going to use about 20 stalks of asparagus, about one inch lengths here. We also need one large onion that's coarsely chopped and one small head of lettuce chopped up too. Instead of lettuce, you could use any spring greens, spinach, endive, uh, stinging nettles, or even dandelion. I'm gonna start with about four tablespoons of butter. Um, once that's melted, we're gonna put in our asparagus and our onions. We'll saute that for about five minutes. Once your onions are translucent, it's time to add the lettuce. We're going to season this with a little bit of salt and pepper. Now that our lettuce is wilted, we can add in some flour, about two tablespoons. We're going to sprinkle over the top and stir that in, let it brown with the butter. I'm going to add a cup of beef broth. You could add chicken broth if you'd like. This is going to uh, work with the flour and thicken right up and make a really good gravy. Probably needs just a little bit more salt. Let's give these dishes a try. The nutmeg is a perfect complement. And then you get the buttery uh, sauce soaked into that bread. Very good. The ragu is excellent. The nuttiness of the sauce uh, really mixes very well with the asparagus. You can still taste it in there. It's very good. Uh, even if you're someone who's finicky, especially about asparagus, you should try this. It's really very, very good. Throughout history, bread has been a vital staple of life. Archaeological evidence suggests that pre-Neolithic cultures uh, baked a very simple flat bread on hot stones and sourdough breads have been made for millennia. First century Romans observed the Celts of Gaul uh, skimming the foam off of beer to create a, a lighter kind of bread. By the 13th century, bread became highly regulated as an early form of wage and price controls. Unscrupulous bakers who cut corners to increase profits faced potentially heavy punishment. Such regulation was common throughout Europe and early documents show that uh, at least an attempt was made for doing the same thing in 18th century colonial America. Over the coming weeks, we're gonna focus on 18th century breads. We're gonna begin our journey with one of the simplest forms, the ship's biscuit. This biscuit is known by many names. Uh, most of the time it was called just biscuit, sometimes it was called hard biscuit, or brown biscuit, uh, sea biscuit, and ship's bread. Now many today might want to call it hardtack, but hardtack is really a 19th century term that was popularized during the American Civil War. These 18th century biscuits, they're not like today's buttery, flaky version that we serve along with sausage gravy for breakfast. These biscuits were not made to be enjoyed, they were made out of necessity. So ship's captains faced a continual challenge of having enough food on board to feed a large crew for a long journey. Food spoilage was really his greatest concern. Fresh bread rapidly became moldy on long trips, and so did stored flour, which would go rancid and bug-ridden. So uh, hard biscuit is really born out of necessity. It's a means of food preservation. If it was prepared properly and stored properly, it would last for a year or more. In addition to preservation, the uh, biscuit form 
also helped in portability and in dividing the rations when it came time. Uh, soldiers and sailors uh, typically got one pound of bread a day, and the biscuits were usually made in about a four ounce form. So when it came time to distribute them, each sailor or soldier would get four biscuits. Biscuits from London were considered to be the highest quality, the most resistant to mold and to insects. Uh, they were really the standard by which all the other biscuit makers aspired to, but not all biscuits were the same quality. In a book called Adventures of Roderick Random from 1748, we read this uh, little section here. Every biscuit, like a piece of clockwork, moved of its own internal impulse, occasioned by myriads of insects that dwelt within it. There are other counts of sailors opening up barrels marked sea biscuits, and only to find them filled to overflowing with roaches, the sea biscuits having long since disappeared. Biscuits were not only used by sailors, but also soldiers and travelers, travelers of just about any sort. Uh, traders many times used them to bargain with the Indians, and they were also thought to have medicinal properties. Uh, they used them in treating uh, edema and indigestion and gout. Just as biscuits had different names and different uses, they were also made in different ways. The term biscuit has its origins in the word twice baked. Uh, many 18th century recipes call for bread rolls to be baked, sliced into slices, and then baked again. Uh, these are also known as rusks. Ben Franklin in his memoir also called this type of biscuit the true original biscuit much superior to the unleavened variety. But it's this unleavened variety that we're going to do today. We've preheated our oven and allowed it to cool to a medium low heat. If you're doing this in a, in a home oven, about 300 to 350 degrees. Our ingredients for these biscuits, very simple. We've got some whole wheat flour. You're definitely gonna need some salt. And then we need enough water to make a very stiff dough. So let's get these mixed up. I'm gonna probably work with about two pounds of flour here, enough to make eight four ounce biscuits. We're gonna just uh, guess our amount of salt and get that mixed in. And now let's pour in that water until we get a good stiff dough. got this larger loaf kneaded here. Uh, now it's time to break this up into the individual approximately four ounce uh, portions for each biscuit and then I'll form those up individually. Each one of these I'm going to knead just a little bit more and get it into its patty or biscuit, final biscuit shape. These biscuits are ready to go on the baking tray here. We're gonna arrange them. They're not going to rise up so we can put them right next to each other. We wanna make sure that they're the final proper thickness, about a half an inch, maybe a little thinner. And we need to prick them so that they don't puff up too much. Okay. These are ready for the oven. We're gonna put these in, and they're gonna bake for two to three hours at that low temperature. Uh, you wanna watch them to make sure they don't burn. It's been three hours. Uh, these should have baked long enough. Uh, many times in the time period, these would be baked and then pulled out, they'd let them cool, and then they'd bake them again the next day, probably at a lower temperature, uh, to drive out any excess moisture. And for very long-term storage, they might bake these three or four times. Let's take a look. 
Hard biscuits could be eaten just as they are, but it was never thought of as an enjoyable event. Uh, many times they were soaked in wine, brandy, or sack to soften them up a little. Cooks would also take the biscuits and they would uh, grind them up or powder them by putting them in a bag and beating them with a hammer. Uh, then take that, the crumbs that are left over and use them like flour. This crunched up biscuit tastes a lot like raisin bran without the raisins. While this isn't the most flavorful recipe that we've done so far, it's certainly a very significant food source for people in the 18th century. Bread was an important food source in the 18th century. Not only was it a staple in and of itself, but it was also an, an important ingredient in many other foods. It was known to many as a staff of life. Bread played such an important role in the nutritional needs of society that when there were shortages in the supply of wheat, other grains had to be used to avoid mass starvation. Today we're going to be making a multi-grain loaf that would be very similar to the kind of bread used to feed common people in the 18th century. During the latter half of the 18th century, Western European countries saw a massive increase in population. England itself saw a 70% increase in its population during that same period. This expansion had a dramatic effect on the demand and availability of food. Wheat, for instance, doubled in price in this time period. The result was an important trade link between the American colonies and England. Wheat became the largest export crop for the mid-Atlantic colonies in the 1700s. Uh, when George Washington decided to diversify away from tobacco, he chose to cultivate wheat. And consumer goods that were imported into the colonies were often paid for in wheat flour. Back in England, wheat was so important in feeding the populace that the British government enacted laws regulating the production of bread. These ordinances fixed the price of the bread while controlling the weight of each loaf, all according to the price of wheat flour. Commercial baking became highly regulated. Uh, the types of bread that bakers could bake, the grains to be used, and even their salaries were decreed by law. For centuries, white bread was revered by the public as the best bread to eat. Uh, the white bread flour came from regular flour that was bolted or sifted many times through cloth to get the finest flour available. Originally, this flour was separated out and used only for sacramental bread or for bread for the gentry. But over time, the regular public started to demand to have this white bread too. Members of the medical community and government did their best to encourage the consumption of whole wheat or brown bread, as it was thought that it was much more healthy than the white bread that the common people demanded. But these claims were met with general resistance. These mixed grain breads were made with a combination of grains, wheat, barley, oats, and rye. And at other times, other things were included, potatoes, rice, beans, even peas. Mixed breads were generally considered far inferior in taste and in texture to wheat and breads. Uh, this is a, a loaf that's made from a regulated ratio of two parts green pea flour to one part wheat flour. This is not the bread we're going to make today. Instead, we're going to be making this mixed bread. It's uh, made from wheat flour, rye flour, and barley flour. It would have been a much less expensive loaf to produce, uh, intended mostly for commoners. It would have been found in England and the American colonies. Let's get started. Let's start by talking about yeast. Bakers in the 18th century got their yeast from the brewer. The brewer collected the yeast uh, by skimming the croissant or the foam that is uh, on the top of a fermenting batch of ale. Bakers would then cultivate this yeast. It was called barm and it was in a liquid form. Here's how to make your own barm. You need uh, some ale, either a homebrew or a good imported ale. You could use water, but ale makes a, a better product, a more authentic flavored bread when you're finished. We've got a bottle here with about a half a cup of wheat flour in it. And to that I'm gonna add one and a half teaspoons of dry active yeast. And to that I'm gonna add this 12 ounce bottle of imported ale. 
Now we need to give this a really good shake and get all the dry ingredients mixed up. Once you've got it all good and mixed up, you can set this aside, give it uh, 15 or 20 minutes to activate. Our dough is fairly simple. We've got three kinds of flour. I've got a, a, a wheat flour, a rye flour, and a barley flour. Because the flours have differing densities, uh, we really, it's best to weigh them. Uh, but in this case, it turns out to be about a cup and a half of wheat flour, a cup and three quarter of rye, and two cups of barley flour. That's about eight ounces of each one of these flours. Because we're using both wheat flour and rye flour, this is sometimes called maslin bread. All these flours are usually available at your local grocery store in the specialty baking section. To this we're going to add about a tablespoon of salt. And now we can mix it up. Now let's add our barm. We're going to add that with about four to six ounces of water. And we're going to mix this and it should bake a nice, sticky, but firm dough. We're going to need this quite a while until the dough becomes very elastic. Now I'm going to form this up into a loaf. We're going to take our redware pie pan and sprinkle it with a little bit of flour. And we can put our loaf in there and cover it with natural linen. Natural linen uh, is something that we offer in, on our website and in our print catalog. This is a whole grain dough. It's going to take quite a while to rise, several hours, even overnight. We want it to rise till it's about twice as big as when it started. We want to make sure to preheat our oven. Uh, if you're using an earthen oven, you want to get that up to full temperature and then let it cool down to bread temperatures. Uh, if you haven't got your wood-fired oven yet, you can use a, a standard home oven. You want to make sure to preheat it to about 400 degrees. For more information about baking in an earthen oven like this, you want to make sure to check out our video, Baking Bread in an Earthen Oven, Part 2. We're going to transfer our dough onto our peel. First we sprinkle a little cornmeal, and now we can turn our dough out onto the peel. Your bread's going to take 30 to 45 minutes to bake, depending on the temperature of your oven. Well, this looks done. It should sound hollow when tapped. And you should let this cool at least an hour before slicing. You know, the crust might be tough, but for all their complaints about this not being white bread, this mixed grain bread is very good. In our last episode, we covered mixed breads. These mixed grain breads were made with other grains in addition to wheat to make a cheaper loaf for laborers. Uh, these breads were promoted to ease the demand on wheat in Great Britain and Western Europe. As we discussed, this demand for wheat created an important trade link between the mid-Atlantic colonies where wheat was grown and Great Britain. The majority of wheat that was grown in these colonies was exported. This created a void of sorts in the food supply for the colonists. It was only natural for this void to be filled by something that was native to the Americas, corn. In our recent episodes, we've taken a closer look at breads of the 18th century. 
In this episode, we're going to be looking at an early cornbread. For common people in 18th century Great Britain and the American colonies, there existed three main dietary pillars, bread, pottage, and ale. People depended on these three things for survival. While there were many similarities between English cooking and that of the colonies, there were also some vast differences as well. Using corn was one of them. Now before we proceed, let's clarify the word corn. Corn used in the 18th century meant a kernel or granule of something, like a grain of wheat or rice or barley or even gunpowder. When we say corn, we usually mean yellow corn, field corn, or sweet corn. But in the 18th century, they always used the term Indian corn or maize. In Great Britain, the common perception was that Indian corn was unfit for human consumption. They considered it animal fodder. You simply won't find recipes that use corn in the old English cookbooks of the 18th century. There's a passage in Joseph Plum Martin's Revolutionary War memoir that expresses this sentiment. When they, speaking of British soldiers, could find none to wreak their vengeance upon, they cut open the knapsacks of the guard, the Continental Guard that is, and strewed the Indian meal about the floor, laughing at the poverty of the Yankee soldiery, who had nothing but hog's fodder, as they termed it, to eat. The earliest European settlers to the Americas were introduced to this grain, this corn, by the Indians. They'd been cultivating and eating this corn for thousands of years. So as demand grew for wheat in growing Western Europe, more and more of it was exported away from the American colonies. Corn grew in importance in the diet of the colonists, especially for the rural and the poor. So interestingly, the three dietary pillars of porridge, bread, and ale, they remained the same but with variations. A porridge that was traditionally made with oatmeal is made with cornmeal in the colonies. Uh, the wheat and bread that was eaten in Europe uh, gets made into corn journey cakes or uh, johnny cakes. And of course, ale sometimes replaced by corn whiskey. In our research, we did find a number of 18th century experimental recipes for a yeast-based bread using Indian corn. These British recipes uh, used a combination of cornmeal and wheat flour, very similar to the mixed grain breads that we made in the last episode. Now it makes a very delicious loaf, but it appears like that it was very unpopular. Here's one author's appeal. He says, this makes a very cheap, and flavorful and nourishing bread. The color of it is true, is very different from that of common bread, but we often eat by choice cakes and other kinds of confectionery as deep colored as this, and provided that what is set before us is palatable and wholesome, we must not in times of scarcity object to it because it may not be altogether pleasing to the sight. Now, when you think of cornbread, you probably think of something like this. These modern day mixes, depend on baking soda or baking powder to give it a light and airy texture. But the earliest forms of cornbread in colonial America were of an unleavened type, very similar to the oat cakes or bannock bread that you'd find in the Scottish Highlands. It wasn't until the early 19th century that chemical leavening agents like pearl ash or saleratus were introduced and used to make a cornbread that we might be used to. The earliest cornbread recipe we have so far is from Amelia Simmons in 1796. Let's make some. We'll start with about a cup of milk. I'll put this in a saucepan over a low heat to scald. To this, I'm going to add three tablespoons of butter, a tablespoon of molasses, and a pinch of salt. Now let's stir this around. In a separate bowl, I've got three cups of cornmeal and a half a cup of wheat flour. After the milk is heated, I'm gonna add this to our cornmeal and mix it well. Now we've gone ahead and made a second batch so that we can cook it in two different ways. We're gonna take this second batch and pour it into an already greased uh, pie pan and we'll bake this. When it's done in this method, it's called a common loaf. 
and we're just going to settle that into our pan evenly and put this into the oven already preheated. For more information about how to cook with one of these earthen ovens, make sure to check out our Building an Earthen Oven Part 2, Baking Bread. Uh, that'll teach you how to use this if you're going to be using a regular oven at home. Uh, you can bake this at 375 degrees for about a half an hour. While our common loaf is baking, we're going to make up some journey cakes or johnny cakes. I've got our other batch of dough here and I'm just gonna form up some patties about a half an inch thick or so and three or four inches around. And these we can fry in our pan. If we're gonna use these as journey cakes, take them with us in a haversack, we wanna cook them dry without any oil or butter in the pan. If you're gonna eat them right away, you can use uh, butter or grease in your pan and uh, they are really tasty. Laborers and slaves would bake these cakes on their hoes right over an open fire, thus the name hoe cakes. They could also be baked on a bannock board right before the fire. A great simple adaptation of bread made with corn in a North American kind of way. I've got a sauce here. It's uh, something I ran into an old cookbook. It's got molasses, butter, and a splash of vinegar. Let's try this out with a little bit of our cornbread here. Mm. This would make a great meal in and of itself and also very good with soup or beans. As we continue our series on 18th century breads, we feel we've only just begun to discover the complex role bread plays in history. Today we'll take a closer look at leaven in the 18th century, how to preserve it and then how to use it. First, we need to make a distinction between the word leavening and the word leaven. The word leavening is a generic term, meaning anything that you add to dough that creates a, a lighter and fluffier loaf when you're finished. Leavening can be mechanical. We can whip air into egg whites, creating a meringue that we fold into batter to make a, a lighter bread. We can also use a chemical agent such as pearl ash or saleratus, similar to the modern uh, baking soda and baking powder. Uh, these create a chemical reaction, uh, carbon dioxide bubbles are formed, and this creates a, a quick bread, a, a lighter and fluffier sort of bread. Then there's yeast, which is a biological agent. The word leaven, at least in the 18th century, means a lump of old dough. We know from archaeological evidence that yeast has been used for thousands of years for brewing beer and for baking bread. By the mid-1700s, two strains of yeast had been domesticated, ale yeast used for brewing beer and for baking bread, and lager yeasts, which the Germans had developed for brewing beer at cooler temperatures for longer periods of time. By the late 18th century, ale yeast had been further refined by the Dutch for commercial sale specifically to bakers. Now, while modern commercial baking yeasts have been cultivated into various strains, they still remain the same species of ale yeast. Now there's a third species of yeast we have yet to mention. That's wild yeast. Wild yeast exists everywhere. It exists in the air, on your skin, even on the grains of wheat themselves. Many 18th century bread recipes call for the use of barm, which is that soupy um, yeast mixture that's skimmed off the top of a fresh batch of ale. In our mixed bread episode, we showed you how to make a modern equivalent to barm. For the British palate, barm was the preferred form of yeast. They liked this lighter, sweeter bread. Uh, in fact, there were laws passed that prevented professional bakers from recycling or reusing their yeast, this old dough, which resulted in a much sharper flavor. In contrast to the British, up until 1670, the French outlawed the use of barm yeast in making bread in favor of the much more flavorful and acidic old dough or leaven method. We talked about our generic term of leavening and the term leaven, which means old dough. After our initial 
a batch of bread dough is yeasted, we save back a piece of this dough for our next batch, whether it's the next day or the next week. And as this process continues, each time we make the dough, we save some back for the next batch, it turns into what we call sourdough. But I'll explain that more in a minute. Now, there were many reasons to use this old dough or leaven. The first one was flavor. It gave a much more rich and kind of sharper flavor to the bread. But there were other reasons also, not only in France, but in Great Britain and America. Because of the importance of ale in the 18th century diet, virtually everyone had access to ale yeast or barm. But there were circumstances when the supplies were very limited. Take, for instance, William Ellis who wrote the 1750 book, Country Housewife Family Companion, and in it he mentions a shortage of yeast during the Great Frost of 1740. This year marked the coldest period during what is now known as the Little Ice Age. Yeast was very scarce during that time in Europe because of the extended period of frigid temperatures that prevented it from being cultivated. When barm was in short supply, leaven was used to replace it. But there was another reason to use leaven and that was to preserve yeast from one session to the next. Frequent use of a wood-fired oven was impractical and inefficient for the home baker. So, uh, there needed to be a way to preserve yeast from one baking session to the next. Now we have to remember that in the 18th century, no one fully understood yeast. How, what it was and how it worked, any of these things. It wasn't until the mid-1800s that uh, yeast was proven to be a living organism. Now the difference in taste between bread made with barm and that made with uh, leaven has a lot more to do with bacteria than it does with the yeast that's involved. Bacteria lives along with yeast inside of every ball of dough. It converts sugars that are in the dough into lactic acid. So if you let your dough ferment long enough, it doesn't matter whether you start with a, a wild yeast culture or a barm, your dough will begin to sour. It'll begin to take on those, those uh, characteristics of sourdough bread. And so your dough may not taste exactly the same as some regionally famous sourdough breads. It will be a sourdough bread nonetheless. For the first part of our demonstration today, we're gonna make a very simple bread dough. I've got uh, four cups of uh, a simple uh, bread flour here, unbleached. And I'm gonna add to that uh, just a, uh, a teaspoon of uh, kosher salt. And now I've got some yeast. I could mix up barm, but since this isn't really the main part of what we're doing here, this is just a, a start. Um, we're gonna use dry instant yeast. It'll end up being exactly the same in the end. So that's what we're gonna use here. So I'm gonna use a packet of instant yeast. And now we're going to add to that um, about a cup and a half of warm water. Make a pool here. Should make just about the right consistency. Now we've got this mixed. Let's uh, turn this dough out onto a floured surface here. We'll get that mixed up. And we'll knead this until it's ready, until it's uh, nice and soft. Okay, this dough is ready to let it set and rise, but now's the time I'm gonna extract a piece of dough to use for the next time I'm gonna bake bread. So here we go, here's a piece of dough. We're gonna save this for later. And we're gonna take this, reform it up into our shape, Let's put it in the dough bowl and let it set for baking. We'll let this set an hour or two and then we'll bake it in our oven. Now here's our, our dough that we've taken off for the next baking. If we're going to use this dough tomorrow or if we were gonna use it maybe the day after, we can just take this ball and put it into a little pile of uh, um, flour and, and save that for later on. But if we aren't gonna bake for seven days or 10 days, we need to, a way to preserve this for later use. So what we can do is we can store that in some salt. To preserve this properly, what we're gonna do is we're gonna punch a hole in our dough. We're gonna take that and fill the hole with salt so that 
got salt in the middle of it. Once this is salted, we're gonna make a little cavity in our, uh, in our salt canister. And we're gonna pour salt right on top and fill that up so it's covered up with salt. And this will dry out. It'll be, it'll be a little hard lump when it, when it comes out of here in a week or 10 days. In our next episode, we're gonna take this preserved uh, dough ball and we're going to wake it back up. We're gonna use it to bake some bread. We're also gonna start a wild yeast culture. In our last episode, we made leaven. Leaven is old dough that you uh, save back and you use it to inoculate a new batch of dough with yeast. We uh, took our leaven and we, uh, we preserved it in salt. Today we're gonna wake this leaven back up and use it to make a new batch of bread. Last week we uh, prepared a dough and then we saved off a little piece, the leaven, uh, to use this week. This is the dough that it was sitting in the salt. Uh, what we need to do now is to scrape off as much salt as possible. We put the salt on earlier because we wanted it to be dry. We wanted it to slow down the yeast activity. Now that we want to wake it back up, we need to get as much salt off as possible. I'm going to chop this leaven, this dried leaven, up into the smallest pieces possible. Uh, we're going to dissolve this in water so the, the smaller the particle size, the better. When we're done with this, we can add about a cup of nice warm water so we can get this to dissolve. Now I'm going to keep stirring this so I can get as much dissolved as possible. I need to strain out as much of this crusty material as possible. It really doesn't dissolve, so I'm going to strain it through this cloth. We're going to end up with about three quarters of a cup of liquid yeast. Now I'm gonna make a sponge. I'm gonna add about a cup and a half of good quality bread flour and uh, stir this in. It's gonna make, uh, make a very soupy mixture. This is where the yeast is really gonna come alive. We're gonna cover this up and set this aside. It may take as much as overnight for this to wake back up. You'll wanna cover it with either some wet cloth or some plastic. Now we prepared a sponge last night. Let's have a look at this. When this is ready, you're gonna see large bubbles starting to form. It'll have a very spongy texture. Let's make our dough. I'm gonna start off with about three cups of bread flour in a bowl. To that, I'm gonna add about two teaspoons of salt. Now let's put about uh, a cup of this sponge into our uh, flour. Now that we've got this sponge in here, I'm gonna add a cup of nice warm water and then mix this into our dough. This dough looks a little wet, so I'm gonna sprinkle it with a little extra flour before I turn it out and knead it. I'm gonna knead this until it's nice and smooth and soft. At this point, it's time to take another piece of dough off of this to save it for our next batch of bread. I want a, a piece that's about a half a cup or maybe a whole cup of uh, dough. And we'll put this in salt just like we did before. Now back to our bread dough. Let's uh, put it in a dough bowl and cover it with a cloth. We want this to double in size. It may take an hour. It may take a couple of hours, depending on the temperature and, and your yeast, just how active it is. This dough has risen. I'm going to go ahead and lightly punch it down and reform it back into our loaf, put it back in the dough bowl, and let it rise for the final time. Now we could bake this bread in our earthen oven, but today we're going to use our Dutch oven. There seems to be a modern resurgence in baking in Dutch ovens, but this technique has really been used for hundreds of years. Dutch ovens were commonly used in 18th century kitchens. They were known by various names and they took on various forms, but they were known throughout Great Britain, France, and the American colonies. Dutch ovens played an important role in the uh, American colonies as well as the later on Western expansion. Lewis and Clark took numerous Dutch ovens along on their Western expedition. These vessels were favored by 18th, 19th, and even 20th century cooks and sojourners for their versatility 
They could be used for soups and stews, for frying, as well as for roasting and baking, even bread. We found one early 19th century source that used the term Dutch oven and bread oven interchangeably. When it came to baking for a single meal, these were much more efficient than a wood-fired oven. Because of their versatility and efficiency, they were also highly valued. You could frequently find them in old 18th century last will and testaments and in household inventories. James Townsend and Son offers three different sizes, a four quart, an eight quart, and a 12 quart model. While our loaves are rising, we started a, a small fire to preheat our Dutch oven. And then we can use these embers when it's done to help bake. This dough is ready to bake. Uh, let's prepare our Dutch oven. We had this oven over the fire and it's warmed up. Don't skimp on preheating this. You want it to be nice and hot when you get started. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, sprinkle some cornmeal into the bottom of that. This'll keep the loaf from sticking. You know, just a very thin layer here. That looks good. And it should brown up just a hair so you can see that the uh, oven is getting the right temperature. Now we can slip this loaf in. You wanna make sure that it's loosely in your bowl so you can just, uh, just nudge it in there. So here we go. Okay, here it goes. And we're just gonna get it into shape here. This turned over, but that's all right. And now we're gonna slice the, uh, slit the top here so it can grow a little bit. You want a nice sharp knife for this. And then you can slice it. I'm gonna slice it the other way too. There we are, nice and deep. That looks really good. Now, we're gonna close this up. And I've already got our bottom coals going. I got a nice ring, there's an open center here. We don't want it to get too, too hot. And we're gonna set that on, put our lid on. Now we're gonna bring in and put more coals up on top of the oven. I got a good layer of uh, coals up on top now. We're gonna let this cook. It should cook about 30 minutes uh, until it's a really nice golden brown. For a nice even baking, you wanna pick this up and rotate it a quarter of a turn every five or 10 minutes. After 15 minutes, you uh, wanna take the lid off and take a peek to make sure this thing isn't overcooking. Uh, then you can adjust the heat accordingly. We took a quick look at uh, 15 minutes and it was progressing rather well. I'm sure now that it's about 30 minutes in that this is ready to take a look. And we're gonna take the lid off here. We can see that it really is looking quite nice and golden brown. Sourdough bread is a much more dense bread, so it can take a little bit more cooking than you might think. Don't, don't worry about possibly overcooking it a little bit. It's gonna need a little bit of that to get the heat all the way into the inside. So let's get this out of here. And there we have it, bread uh, baked from leaven, or old dough. This, uh, we even baked it in a Dutch oven, and we've saved off dough for the next time we're going to bake bread. You know, each time you repeat this process and save back dough, you get a little bit more flavor. Each time, it's, it's going to keep developing and make a, a wonderful tasting bread. For a couple of weeks now, we've been anticipating doing an episode on cultivating wild yeast to make an 18th century sourdough bread. But the more we did research, the more it became apparent that this was not something that they did in the 18th century. Now today, if you ask 50 people about how to start a wild yeast culture for making sourdough bread, it's likely you'll get 100 different answers. But in reality, all it takes is a little bit of flour and some water and some time. Now the question remains, did people in the 18th century knowingly and intentionally propagate wild yeast? Our initial conclusion was yes, due to the frequent references to sour bread. But as we dug deeper, we found only three uh, references to propagating wild yeast, none of those prior to 1790. They were either examples of scientific experiments or they were from non-European cultures. Interestingly, the typical response to this, these experiments is astonishment. Let me read to you this uh, a little excerpt or a little piece from a journal. This is dated 1790 and it's from the Transactions of the Society for the Encouragement of Arts, Manufacturing, and Commerce. 
And they, this is in context to about a, a contest. This society had a contest about the manufacture of yeast. And this is a man writing about experiments that he's doing to make yeast. Here the man writes about his, uh, his assistant. He accordingly brought me some small vessel with the full head of yeast upon it, assuring me with some degree of exultation that neither oil of vitriol with chalk nor any portion of old yeast had been employed on that occasion. This greatly surprised me, and I desired he would proceed with the experiment. So his experiment had to do with having a boiled water and malt and nothing else, and just letting this set over time. He was uh, cultivating a wild yeast, and he didn't even know it. Now, there are many 18th century recipes for making yeast in circumstances when yeast was in short supply. Now, other than these experiments that I've already mentioned, they all had to do with propagating yeast from a little bit of pre-existing yeast. So it was very surprising for these experimenters to find that you could make a yeast slurry without adding any pre-existing yeast. So it's apparent that these experiments flew against the conventional wisdom. So what does this mean for the 18th century reenactor or historic site? Should we be using a bread uh, baked with barm or sourdough bread made with leaven? Well, it really depends on who we're trying to portray, what our culture is, what our class is, and what our climate is. The one thing we can seem to draw from this information is, is that propagating wild yeast in the manner in which uh, we do today to make sourdough bread is not an historically accurate option. It's been a very interesting uh, bread baking technique that's been floating around the internet since about 2007. It's called No Need Bread. Uh, it uses a very simple dough, a high moisture content, and it's baked in a Dutch oven. I would encourage you to watch the video sometime. It's very worthwhile. Uh, no Need Bread, because of its simplicity and its great flavor, is a very innovative technique compared to modern bread baking methods. But I'll let you in on a little secret. Now, this is not a new idea. In fact, no need breads have been around for hundreds of years. Today I'm going to show you how to do an 18th century version of no need bread. We're going to bake it in an 18th century manner. We're going to use that old Dutch oven that so many modern bakers are falling in love with. There are many different kinds of breads in the 18th century. Some of them were baked from a very fine white flour, others made from very coarse flour. Still others were made with wheat flour mixed with other grains. But today we're going to focus on a bread uh, known by the 18th century British and North American colonists as French bread. Now when I say French bread, what one might think is a baguette, a batard, or a brioche. Uh, most people think of a French bread as a, a, a firm white bread with an open crumb structure and a crispy crust. Numerous 18th century English cookbooks contain recipes for French bread, but this French bread is nothing like the modern French bread. Uh, modern breads made with just flour, water, yeast, and some salt. No, these French breads in these 18th century cookbooks are always made with milk and sometimes eggs and butter. This English version of French bread was made into uh, loaves or into rolls. The rolls were sometimes referred to as manchet bread, which can mean the quality of a bread or sometimes its size and shape. This French bread had its crust either rasped away or chipped off with a knife. 18th century French bread was commonly used as an ingredient in other dishes. The bread crust was often used in porridges, soups, even in other breads. Let's make some of this French bread. In a large bowl, let's put three cups of flour, bread flour or all-purpose flour will do, and about one and a half teaspoons of salt. That's it for the dry ingredients. Let's do the wet ingredients. The original recipe calls for barm. And since nobody has barm, which is the foam from the top of beer, instead we're gonna make a substitute barm. Let's start with a half a cup of water. To that, I'm gonna add a heaping tablespoon of flour. And then we need some yeast. We're gonna use instant yeast. You need a, about a quarter of a teaspoon to a half a teaspoon. And then we can stir this all together. 
Now for the rest of the wet ingredients. I'm gonna take just one egg white, let me crack this egg, and we're gonna add that to three quarters of a cup of milk and whisk that together. Now I've got here two tablespoons of uh, melted butter and I'm going to uh, put that in with two egg yolks and we're gonna whisk those together. Now let's add this all together. And we can put in our barm mixture too. And that's it for our wet ingredients. Now I'll mix the wet ingredients with the dry ingredients and I will mix them with these. As soon as the dough is formed and all the flour is absorbed, it's time to stop mixing. Now one of the interesting things about the 18th century recipes is they call for this dough not to be kneaded it makes a very wet and sticky dough. They call it in the recipe, a very light paste. We'll cover this with a damp cloth and set it aside 12 to 24 hours. We could divide this dough up and put it into smaller, uh, well-floured bowls to make rolls. Now we've prepared this batch ahead of time and it's been rising about 18 hours. It's got a very nice spongy texture. So it looks like it's time to start preheating our Dutch oven. We're going to be baking our bread in a Dutch oven today. Baking bread in Dutch ovens is very common in the 18th century, although our recipes don't call for that specifically. We had this oven over the fire and it's warmed up. Don't skimp on preheating this. You want it to be nice and hot when you get started. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, sprinkle some cornmeal into the bottom of that. This'll keep the loaf from sticking. You know, just a very thin layer here. That looks good and it should brown up just a hair so you can see that the uh, oven is getting the right temperature. Now it's time to look at our dough. Now I'm going to turn this out onto a, a liberally floured surface. Now your dough may be a lot stickier than this but that's okay. It, it'll help to flour your hands so that it doesn't stick. Now let's pat this down a little bit. Let's fold it once. Let's fold it twice three times, and one last time, four times we're gonna fold this, and now let's put it in our Dutch oven. You wanna keep a close eye on this while it's cooking. It's gonna take 25 to 30 minutes. You want it to be a nice, deep golden brown without burning on the bottom. If you're gonna bake this in your home oven, you're going to wanna to set your oven to 450 degrees. There, that looks perfect. I'm gonna take it off. And there it is, an 18th century enriched no-knead bread, something that they called in the time period French bread. We wanna make sure that our bread is completely cooled before we rasp or chip off the outer crust. Uh, the, the crust and also this, uh, the French bread as it is, is used in many 18th century recipes. Mmm, who doesn't like a nice big plate of French toast? Nice firm bread soaked in eggs with milk, uh, maybe uh, garnished with a little bit of fresh fruit, some cinnamon, and slathered over the top with maple syrup. Have you ever wondered where this dish came from? What genius mind created it? And who throughout history savored this delectable dish? Well, that's what we're gonna look at today in 18th Century Cooking with James Townsend and Son. We're wrapping up our second series of 18th century cooking with James Townsend and Son. Most recently, we've been looking at 18th century breads, and we thought it would be appropriate to conclude this series with a little sweet treat made with bread. The earliest recipe for French toast can be found in the Apicius. It's a fourth and fifth century collection of Roman recipes. The dish is simply titled a sweet treat, and the translation reads thus, break a slice of fine white bread crust removed into rather large pieces. Soak in milk and beaten eggs. Fry in oil, cover in honey, and serve. Bread was known as a staff of life. It was a dietary pillar. But what does one do when one's bread goes stale? In an old English cookbook from about 1430, we find a recipe for bread that's uh, sliced, dipped in eggs, fried in butter, and then sprinkled with a little bit of sugar. 
the name of this recipe was pan perdu, a French word that means lost bread or wasted bread, suggesting that this recipe was meant to use up stale bread. Karen Hess, who transcribed Martha Washington's Book of Cookery, has this to say in a recipe after pan perdu. It says, the English early took to pan perdu and made it their own. It was rarely omitted from a cookbook, usually listed under made dishes. Made dishes are any dish that amuses the cook or shows off her skill. Let's make French toast or pan perdu in a true 18th century fashion. We're gonna start off with a nice enriched bread. Uh, the no-knead French bread like we made in our last episode would be perfect. If you want to use a more modern bread, you can use a challah bread or a brioche. Any firm bread will do. We cut the crust off this and we let it set out overnight. So we're starting off with a nice stale bread. I'm going to start off here with about eight egg yolks. To that, I'm going to add about a cup of uh, cream. And I'm also going to add some wine, some uh, sack here. We're going to use about a quarter of a cup. Now I'm going to add about two tablespoons of sugar. And finally, I'm going to scrape in a little bit of nutmeg. And we'll whisk this all together. Now let's take our individual bread pieces and put them in the batter. I'm going to let these set for maybe 15 minutes or up to an hour to get this a real good chance to soak in. really depends on how stale your bread is. While these toasts are steeping, I'm going to go ahead and start on our sauce because we want to have the sauce ready to put on it as soon as they're cooked. We're going to start off with about four tablespoons of butter and then once that's melted, let's add in about two tablespoons of sack. And after the sack, we're going to add about a tablespoon of sugar. Now you want to whisk this all together. And you want it to get nice and warm, but we're really not cooking it. We're just really mixing it together. So what I'm going to do is set this aside where it'll stay nice and warm, waiting for us to put it on. We've got the, the butter going in the pan. Let's put in our toast. If your bread is really stale, uh, sometimes it can be very fragile, so you're going to have to be careful as you're putting it in the pan. These look done. Let's get them out of here. Here's our pan perdu, an early version of French toast. Let's give it a try. That is excellent. This topping's a little different from what you and I might expect or what we're used to. Very nice, right out of the 18th century cookbooks. Maple syrup as a topping is a perfect North American variation on that same theme. Their substitute for sugar, maple syrup. Excellent. 